Hello, this is Elizabeth, and welcome back to Root of Rameau's, a poetry series in which we observe the mechanics, aesthetics, and meaning of the greatest founding texts of the Western poetic tradition. Today, we're continuing our textual analysis of the Epic of Gilgamesh by looking at Tablet 8, which features Gilgamesh mourning Inkadu and provides a detail of rituals for burial. As always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know down below. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started with this poetic analysis of Tablet 8. From the very beginning of this tablet, we have Gilgamesh mourning Enkidu's passing. From line 9 to 41, we have an established repetition of form amongst the lines. Each statement consists of the sentiment of may so-and-so mourn you. In this segment of the text, not only does Gilgamesh list the people that Enkidu met on his journey, including the shepherds, the young men and the elders of Uruk the Sheepfold, Shamhat, and others, he also includes a list of the beasts of the wild. More surprising yet is that he includes a variety of nature in the list of those he wishes to mourn Enkidu. This includes the hills, mountains, pastures, Euphrates, and cedar forest. Given the order of Gilgamesh's call for mourning, there are a few possible readings. First, it would be reasonable to argue that the disarray of order within the call of Gilgamesh is being used to illustrate his emotional distress. What I believe to be a more probable reading is that this order is demonstrating an aspect of the Sumerian worldview, namely that they didn't perceive nature, animals, or people as existing in opposition to one another, but rather in congruence, in a kind of spiritual symbiosis. In the next portion, we have Gilgamesh openly sharing his mourning with the young men and elders of Uruk. Here, we're shown the extent of Gilgamesh's sorrow, we see analogies in which Gilgamesh describes Enkidu as being the axe at my side, in which my arm trusted, the dirk at my belt, the shield, at my face, my festive garment, my girdle of delight. These objects illustrate the intense closeness that developed between Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Certainly, given that they had gone into battle together, it's understandable why Gilgamesh would call Enkidu his axe, dirk, and shield. Yet, Gilgamesh goes further here, saying that Enkidu was his festive garment. This suggests that Enkidu's companionship encouraged Gilgamesh to celebrate life. When Enkidu is called my girdle of delight, we can take that to mean that in some capacity, Gilgamesh was happily restrained by Enkidu. One obvious way this occurred was upon their meeting, when Enkidu stood in the doorway of the wedding house and prevented Gilgamesh from entering and continuing down the path of a tyrannical king. In the following lines, we can see how Gilgamesh is slowly coming to terms with the death of Enkidu. He calls upon the various smiths and demands a statue be made of his friend. This includes lapis lazuli, gold, and other materials fit for a king. Now, we have an extensive account of the materials included in the offerings of the ritual of burial. Unfortunately, between lines 96 to 130, there is heavy fragmentation. In spite of this, we can see that gold is frequently mentioned throughout. We can also see the great detail in describing all of the effort made in service of ensuring an honorable burial of Enkidu. After having arranged the material offerings that will accompany Enkidu into the afterlife, there is a shift that's made where attention is paid to give respect to the various gods of the netherworld. So here is a list of the gods in this portion of the text. Each god has crafted a different object, specific to them. Again, due to fragmentation, there are some cases in which we don't know what a god or goddess is being offered. In the narrative, each item is displayed to the sun god Shamash. From this section, we can see the intention behind these offerings. Nearly in every case, Gilgamesh pleads to each deity, may he welcome my friend and walk at his side. So one of the details in this tablet I found the most interesting 
was that the ceremony of mourning started at the break of dawn. Well, I think this practice of separation is done to show respect for the dead. The process of mourning and service given to the dead and to the gods is considered sacred to the Sumerians. Gilgamesh gives the whole of his mind, body, and spirit to the ceremony. To concern himself with anything else within the day would be profane. The amount of resources and attention given to crafting each offered object and in adorning Enkidu's burial shows the belief exercised by both Gilgamesh and the citizens of Uruk. Additionally, from this tablet, we can see how important imagery and symbols are in the process of Gilgamesh's mourning of Enkidu. The eulogy does prove to encapsulate their time together, while also solidifying the emotional involvement of Gilgamesh. It's important to note that the death of Enkidu is also the death of Gilgamesh's innocence, which is pivotal to the entire narrative of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Finally, this tablet provides us with a kind of realism in the story, giving us time to appropriately linger on the deep loss that Gilgamesh feels. This in turn will make the eventual changes in character all the more believable as the epic continues. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.